Hey there, and welcome back to our online Guard the Gospel class. Today, we are talking about the sin study. As in any previous study, and any study to come, it's important to talk about the aim of the study. So when we come into a Bible study, we have a clear goal in mind, and we're not missing the mark. Overall, when it comes to sin, you and I view sin one way, but God views it another. It's so important for us to understand the gravity of sin so that we can appreciate forgiveness. The world challenges us by saying sin isn't that bad or compares every sin to murder and says that, well, at least it's not murder. It's really a huge adjustment to think of sin the way God does versus our culture or even how we were raised to think about sin. It is difficult to see ourselves as maybe not as good of a person as we thought. The aim of the sin study is to help seekers see themselves as our holy God sees them and for them to appreciate their need for forgiveness and repentance. Now, if you've been following along with the videos, we've studied discipleship at this point. So prior to the study, there are some things that are helpful to do beforehand. After studying discipleship, I'll introduce the next topic of sin. I like to, at that point, share the reason or the aim of why we study sin. We aren't interviewing or interrogating or trying to elicit some reaction that would ultimately block the Holy Spirit from working powerfully. I share that the study is more personal and that I plan on sharing specific things that separated me from God. And I would encourage them to likewise be open to share about what separates them from God. I definitely recommend to give the scriptures beforehand so that they're ready. I also like to ask questions like, have you ever talked about sin? To recognize that it's an awkward thing to talk about and do anything I can to help remove any boundaries. I've mentioned that talking about sin is not common and that I personally had to get used to being open about my life. Culturally, it's not common, nor is it really encouraged. Actually, it's quite opposite. So our goal of the sin study isn't to probe into your life unnecessarily. It's to really help us to see our hearts, see sin the way God does, so that we can appreciate grace and forgiveness to a greater degree. The first passage I love to look at to really introduce sin is the passage in Luke 7, verse 36 through 50. It's a great passage to share as an overview as to why we study sin. It's here in this passage where we are introduced to two characters who are dining with Jesus. One is Simon the Pharisee who has invited Jesus to his home. Another is a woman that's just simply called a sinful woman who has barged in to this gathering and immediately begins to wet Jesus' feet with their tears and wipe them with her hair. We're introduced to a contrast between two people in the way they view sin. Simon, being a Pharisee, doesn't see his need and therefore is blinded by his pride to not only see his own heart, but to see Jesus who is right in front of him. And he's contrasted to the woman who is very aware of her sin and therefore very aware of her need for Jesus. Jesus goes on to share a parable about two men who owed different amounts of money, but both were forgiven of their debt. Jesus asked Simon which one would love him more. And Simon correctly answers the one who had the larger debt forgiven. Jesus uses this parable to highlight really the punchline of this section of text, where Jesus goes on to say, he who's been forgiven much, loves much. Jesus is telling us here that the key to greater love or greater discipleship or greater connection in following Jesus is a greater appreciation of the debt of sin that you and I have been forgiven. So the sin study really does launch us into detailing our debt so that we can appreciate forgiveness or grace in the end. This also serves as a warning for us moving forward that Simon, his pride and arrogance prevented him from truly seeing his need and therefore prevents him from truly appreciating forgiveness or grace. So I love to ask, who would you like to be in this story? The one who is launched to a greater degree of love and appreciation than ever before, or one whose pride robbed them of a greater appreciation of forgiveness. Okay, so let's talk about some realistic expectations. John 16, 8 
says that the Holy Spirit convicts the world in regards to sin, righteousness, and judgment. Again, we know that most people don't view sin as a problem. So God has to work. The Holy Spirit has to convict. It's not always the case where someone is going to have their eyes flung wide open, that the light from heaven is going to dawn in the middle of your Bible study, and they're going to fall to their knees begging for forgiveness and repentance. That does happen, of course, but it's not always the case. Be rest assured that opening up the scriptures, sharing those scriptures with your friend is a win, and it gets the ball rolling. Of course, that idea we just discussed does require a bit of discernment, and that's what we'd love to talk about now. Discernment is important. It helps us to know what to focus on and what not to focus on. We want to discern the heart or the deeper, the deeper things that produce a lot of our behaviors. There's no need to cover every sin in the person's entire history. But what is needed is to find what that area or particular sin is that will help them greater appreciate grace. And of course, prayer is needed. Pray to discern sin and pray to connect to their greatest need. James 1.5 tells us that if any of us lack wisdom, that we should pray, and God gives wisdom generously. In regards to discerning, as we've talked about in previous studies, there are two types of people generally, religious people and non-religious people. When studying sin with a religious person, I love to share more of my religious sin and pride. Again, the point is, sharing vulnerably to help connect to them and to help them to see their sin as well. A worldly background, you can share maybe some of the more obvious sins, the outward behaviors. Now, for me, I wouldn't call it a privilege, but I have the benefit of being both religious and very worldly. So I've got lots to share in both realms. You may have grown up very religious and weren't into the big party scene and drinking and impurities and things like that. So if that's the case, hopefully your network of friendships, you could bring in a friend who maybe does have that experience to share either their religious pride, if they're religious, or if they have more worldly behaviors, to have that friend come in and share more vulnerably to help them connect. And depending on the person's background and their experiences, it's more important to discern which passages highlight religious sin and what passage highlight worldly sin. Spend more time talking through the appropriate passages depending on who the person is that you're studying with. A great passage that I love to share is in Mark chapter 7 because it highlights a list of sins that Jesus brings to bear, but the first one is evil thoughts. Again, the list goes on to share a bunch of worldly, outward sins, but the first one Jesus mentions is evil thoughts. That was convicting to me as someone who was religious and prided himself on keeping things clean on the outside, but having so much garbage on the inside, only to see that at points spew out into the world through worldly pleasures and things like that. But seeing evil thoughts shows us that God does care about what's inside our hearts and minds. It's not always the things that catch tension out there in the world that Jesus gets super indignant about. So that's a great passage to show Evil thoughts, the things on the inside, matter big time. What do you do if someone's posture or you're starting to discern that they're uncomfortable or this isn't going anywhere or they're not really being open? Having real, realistic expectations is not to pry it out of them. You may need to lean back and say, okay, I've got to do a, a couple things here to help my friend be comfortable. Maybe it's just spending more time together. Maybe it is just sharing more personally from your experiences. Or ask a few questions like, is this hard for you? Are you feeling interrogated? Because that's the last thing we'd ever want to do. Just have an open dialogue to help them. What if you're discerning after you studied sin passages that their heart wasn't really moved, that the aim of the study wasn't truly accomplished, where they weren't really convicted? There may be a need to change course. The truth about sin is that it's a broad study. So perhaps changing course may be a need, maybe studying out more specific sins like pride or selfishness. Talking with my wife, she would share that with women, sometimes emotional challenges where they're shut down or guarded, scriptures that would connect to the heart, dealing with topics like bitterness or unforgiveness, where the reality, unfortunately, 
So many women have been abused by others for helping them to discern their abuser's sins and the responsibility of their abuser and them helping to see, okay, what has been my response to these moments and perhaps allowing God to be a God of justice. You know, this isn't a script, and our hope is, is that when someone sees their sin as God sees, sees it, that we can move on to the cross and help them to really see where forgiveness takes place. But that's not always the move. So not so fast. We want them to appreciate grace or else it'll fall on deaf ears. Additional areas to explore for marrieds can be finances, parenting, intimacy, how they're working together, or perhaps purity challenges. You can gain a lot from asking them to share about these specific areas. Often in marriage, the husband wants to talk about what the wife needs to change and vice versa. Helping them focus on themselves and their own heart by asking questions like, what do you need to change? Or what would your spouse say you need to change? Those things are super helpful. For singles, I definitely talk about purity and specific sharing from other times in my life. For singles, relationships are so important, as it is with marrieds, but relationships are so important in dealing with perhaps upbringing and any resentment and a lot of repairing and reconciliation. Talking about those things really does reveal the heart. Two topics that I've mentioned earlier in regards to pride and selfishness. There's not a lot of passages on selfishness in particular, but one I do love is over in 2 Timothy 3, where Paul introduces this list of sin as there will be terrible times. Paul goes on to say that these terrible times will be marked by people who love themselves. Now, while the word selfishness, you can't find often in many English translations, this loving of self is key. You got to think, but what does it mean to love someone? Not just self-love, I love myself, self-confidence, but really what does it look like to love someone? You think about them, you sacrifice for them, you do things for them instead of yourself, and on and on it goes. Self-love means that rather than thinking about others, you think about you. So being aware of passages to really help the friend that you're studying the Bible with is paramount. Practicals to consider and additional passages are passages that talk about thought sins versus action sins. A lot of the world, and I know I did for sure, think to myself, well, at least I didn't do it. You know, I have a lot of self-control not to go and actually do what I was thinking. But great passages to research and to think about that highlight God cares and sees our thoughts. So, knowing what sin scriptures or verses that talk about sin that best address thoughts and actions. Take some time, prayer, and discernment to kind of make those connections. I've often been in sin studies where I'm like, oh God, please give me discernment just out of my heart to love them. And sure enough, scriptures come to mind or I end sin studies. I'm like, wow, that was definitely the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's doing its job in convicting, and we get to be a part of it. For the practicals, keep praying for wisdom. Keep praying for discernment. Studying sin with our friends is a lot like going to the doctor. And you go in, you talk to the doctor about your symptoms, and he or she knows that it correlates to certain issues. For us, the need to discern and be wise and pray is paramount. Pressure's off because God is working. We need to be praying and asking for wisdom and discernment. We know the Holy Spirit is convicting, but we can grow in our knowledge of Scripture so that we have the right thing to share at the right moment. So here are your main passages, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Luke 7.36-50, Mark 7.21-22, Galatians 5.19-21, and James 4.17. So your homework here before our next class is to go through these scriptures and write out interpretation, application, and contemplation questions for the sin study, and we'll be ready for the next one. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.